Welcome, welcome to episode 29 of our board game podcast, A Master's Degree in Rolling Terribly. I'm your host, Eddie, and joining me as my co-host, a man who's averaging 1.8 damage per attack lately on his Crabinator, Gaz. Say hi, Gaz. Hi, Gaz. I wish it was 1.8. I feel like it feels like more like zero. It looks like zero and probably feels like zero, but after adding up the DPS meters and dividing it by the amount of attacks you made, it turned into 1.8, which is slightly worse than a basic attack. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Well, I mean, I've only got zeros and red cards in my deck, so it's not like Phil. No, no, no. Phil has red cards and zeros in his deck as well. We saw plenty of that. That's true, actually. Although we did still see his purple card a couple of times, so... <laughs> just I, I, I'm not... I'm not sure where mine is. It was but. it was funny because in our recording, um, when I went back and was editing the actual playthrough, um, the amount of times he drew his red card and then the hands went up to his head, like, "What is that? What oh, is yeah. going on?" Do we have the Do we have the recording of that? Because that yeah. would be great as sound bites. Because it was actually like you could hear him muttering as soon as he drew it. Like, and I'll I'll remove the language so that Daddy doesn't have to edit it out later. But like he draw the card over, and here it was just pure like uh, astonishment. He's like, "What the? Like what happened?" He actually looked like understand. he was in complete another shock. Um, yeah, and you and I was sitting there giggling away, like this is so funny because his his shock and disbelief was so genuine. Yeah, like that's it. It wasn't even frustration. Like I draw it, and I mean by now I'm like, oh look at that, a red one. At least it wasn't yeah, a miss. Yeah. Um, but he's he he was like genuinely like, you know, like this is this isn't supposed to happen. No. Like, no, it's like what do you mean? It's a bug. It's a glitch. This is not right. But every time without fail, it was happening. Mm, it was. It was definitely entertainment. Plus. Oh yeah. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to chat about Scenario 65, A Strong Foundation. Uh, we're going to have a little chat about, and a very key, uh, sorry, a very, I don't know, loosely worded it as a section on guiding us, and I will elaborate a little bit more on that later. And we received another little MDIRT mail, which actually seems like a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to jump straight into Scenario 65, A Strong Foundation. Gaz. Yes. Road event. Oh, what a road event this one was. Like, Gaz when does we not talk remember about it all, quality road events. No, you can't keep repeating this one thing because it, it doesn't, it's not funny anymore. It's, it's, it's like at least top eight road events that we've come <laughs> across, I reckon. And, and I just, I mean. Don't waste time. The feels, the feels on this road event, like. You're doing it. I remember the Outpost event. No, oh, well, that's not what we're talking about right now. So this particular road event, now MDOT Raw will be coming up straight after this, so we'll go more into that when it happens, and I'll remind Gaz. But this one here, I look, I'm not even going to vaguely kind of go in it. It was just we ran into someone, we had to come up with a choice, and this was a visual interpretation. Um, oh, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. And uh, yep. you know, it led to some interesting conversation, and it – led to a bit of uh, division in the way we were looking at things. And when I say that, I mean, I'm the only one that saw things differently. Yeah, that was weird. And we'll, uh, it'd be cool when we don't have to be vague about this, but it was one of those things that only because, and, and it's going to sound, but only because I was correct, right, did it seem very obvious. But at the time, it seemed really obvious, right? Like, it was one of those things we looked at it and was like, okay, that's, I clearly know exactly what the answer is here i can see why they're trying to be confusing with it but this is clearly the answer but then you were like no 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 i think it's this one and i'm like uh okay now i guess there's some doubt and then when we got the answer out i'm like yeah well 100 percent that was correct but it yeah so it was interesting I, I wonder in i mean i'll have more fun talking about this later but if we'd all been unanimous in our decision if it that doubt ever would have entered any of our minds probably not but i guess that's uh, that's the Seeing things from different angles and, you know, passing the card around and having a look at it, you're getting different tidbits of information that may not have been a connection that people were making prior. Yeah. And I, and I, as someone who constantly plays Devil Avocado, right, I was completely fine with you saying, oh, well, what about this? Yeah. Because it does. It tests. It, it's like when we had the Logic one the other time and 
me and Mark got different answers. It was like, okay, well, let's try and work out why mine doesn't work. Mm. And I had to run it through a few times and figured out why mine didn't work. It was like, great, cool. Mark's is the right answer. So That's rare for yeah, you, right? Uh, Working what? out why yours is wrong and why his was right? Oh, I mean, no, nah, I'll admit that I'm wrong um, like once occasionally. <laughs> so no, 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 I'm wrong all the time. But like I like to break down why I'm wrong. And then when I can't work out why I'm wrong, then I tell people, no, you must be wrong. Turn of the round, right? Yeah, well, that's it. I'm happy to be, uh, you know, Turn the mirror on myself. Yeah, whatever the, the phrase is. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, no, that was a that was a cool one. Mm. So last week we went into scenario sixty nine to begin what we believe is a two parter for Mark's retirement, and that was scenario sixty nine. This week uh, we plan to start mine, which involves scenario sixty five, and I've been p- putting this off for a bit because I was very set on playing uh, a snowflake for a while and we thought we'd get this one going especially after seeing mark's one and seeing that there was going to be a three-week wait i was like well we better get we better get cracking onto this and I yours talk, wasn't a three-week wait i will yours talk like more about that later brain, right like this is this is frodo like bill just gave you the ring that's where we are <laughs> in the length of time your personal quest is going to take to complete Look, we don't know that for sure, but so far, Whoa, yes, it's, feel, it's feeling a little extended, extra edition cut, whatever, right now, yes. All right, so A Strong Foundation put us onto a big traditional kind of map. We haven't seen one of these in a while where it was like a big map and a door and a bunch of stuff around. We had uh, frozen corpses, which personally I really like fighting. We had uh, living bones which I also really like fighting. These are things that we don't see very often. And then we had snow imps. Um, and look, we haven't seen them in a little while. We just had forest imps before that. Mm. And I think a couple of scenarios ago, we had the black imps. Yeah, I think it's more just coming that I hate imps. Like I don't think frost imps are anything worse than the others. And in fact, brittle is probably less annoying than yeah. curse and poison. Yeah. So in actual fact, they're probably the best imps. I think so. I think it was more we were getting them over and over and over again. Yeah, but I, but now that we're getting other imps, we realize that they're equally as annoying as each other. Yeah. And to top off the new interesting part about this scenario, at least from the get-go, this was our first taste of icy terrain. Oh, yeah, that's right. So we hadn't seen it, but the minute I saw the setup and I started putting it out, I got really excited because we've been talking about this and... Um, I know it's in the rule book and, uh, but I hadn't seen it yet and I didn't know kind of, you know, I have seen through browsing discord and Reddit and all of that, a little bit of conversation about, oh, how does this ability work or how does this force Mm. movement work or trying to never get the rules of it. So I was a little bit mm, worried that we were going to run into a couple of issues with it. So we had to sort of wait and see. There's a, there's a bit of a running joke or at least a kind of theme that every time we play I learn again how monster focusing works. It's kind of been going for about the last 12 weeks because I always go, oh, okay, well, I read something and now it's now I understand it again. And when Icy Terrain got put down, it's like, oh, hang on, I have more monster focusing questions. Wait, how does this work? And what was funny is that when you explained it, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, why are there heaps of questions about this? So yeah, it was interesting to see it on and play it out and then all the different, uh, I guess, interactions with it and how they could go about. Definitely. Cause it, cause I think that the big thing was it counts as zero movement tiles, right? Yeah. Like it takes no movement to move through them, which creates weird things when you're counting the spaces away from something. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. For, was, for monster focus and, and things like that, it yeah. created a slight hesitation moment where it was kind of like, wait, is this right? Mm. Um, all right, scenario goal. Scenario is complete when all enemies in it are dead. At the end of that Wait, thing. What's that's new? Okay, Gloomhaven, settle down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Let's go back in time. That, and, you know, I'll tell you what. Like, I'll, I'll ask... Oh, sorry. Special rules, right? Uh, all monsters add push one to all their attacks, right? Oh, God, that was <laughs> gross. This is the second one in a row that my retaliate card is basically being useless. Mm. You, you, I you, learned... You learned this, that about... This, two th- are they halfway through this scenario? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That apparently uh, if you push something, you don't get retaliated. Did not know that. Uh, no, well, if you were only Gemini, it would have been different, right? Correct, because I had like range three retaliate. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. So we had frozen corpses, living bones, snow imps. We had ice terrain, initial thoughts, room setup, and the rules. Yeah, yeah it was cool. It was. Uh, it seemed uh, kind of back to uh, basics, and not basics is in easy, but just basics is in like you know, there's uh, some terrain here, some big beefy monsters, some skeletons. Let's just go at it. Right, like it looked uh, looked like a lot of opportunities to just hey, what cards you want to play? Let's let's do some damage. Sandboxy, right? It's like the yeah. beginning. Is, you don't have anything that's directly. We need to get to a. Watch out for this a. I mean, the fact that I wasn't putting tokens on the board, like letters and numbers, was refreshing. And yep. you know, to to be able to at the very start, everyone's just like, well, do whatever you want, right? Yeah, we know what we have to do. Yeah. Clear everything. Open the door. Yeah, the I feel a little bit like. Um, you know, in, in shows like uh, like Supernatural did it, X-Files did it. There's been heaps of shows that do it. So but they, they have like their monster of the week, right? When shows start, the, each episode is like a different mystery or monster or something like that. And then occasionally they start going into these story arcs, which might last for four or five episodes or sometimes the whole season. I almost feel when we get these scenarios, it's almost like, we're back to just that monster of the week. Let's just have some fun, right? Let's, yeah. There's no there's no complication. There's no bigger, even though this is a ridiculously long story arc. But uh, there is, like, just play, right? Just yeah. have some fun uh, and uh, things will come along. And I, and I, that's what I felt when I opened this uh, this room up. I was just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Let's let's go. Let's see what we can do. And actually, we, we actually started this scenario due to something that happened before it with um, some positive like buffs that were on us as well, which funnily enough changes the way we sort of do a first rounder with prep and all that. Cause we actually had strength in the started off with. So mm. all of a sudden it was kind of like, oh, normally I want to ward everyone and, and all that at the very start. This time it was like, no, I want to hit something right. Mm. Right from the very get go. Yeah. Let's get in there. Get in there. And, and it was really cool. We, we all started to do our thing. We started to spread out. It was really, really cool. I wanted to focus a little bit now, the fact that we have imps again means they're flying again. And this map has ice everywhere, like in just weird spots. And then there's in the corner, you've got a little bit of difficult terrain. And then in other areas, you've got hazardous terrain. And all I could think about was, I'm going to have a lot of fun with this. And one of the first things I did was I went really far forward, nice and aggressive, and plopped two hazardous terrain tiles on the floor. I've got a card that basically allows me to put two hazardous terrain tiles on the board and then anything in hazardous terrain. And there's a caveat here up to three, three enemies, choose three enemies that are currently in hazardous terrain. I had five in hazardous terrain. I was about to pop a 10 damage turn. Um, and as of course, read the whole card, right? So as I'm playing it, I'm like up to three. Oh no. So I had to choose which three and you know, it was still a six damage turn, but Oh God, that upset me so much. Cause I had built up for that. Um, with some of the positioning and then we had to basically pick them off we had horde boy mark playing super aggressively mm. super aggressive very aggressive yeah very aggressive yeah yes. because he's you know flopping his big dick out and he's just like look at me look at me i'm i'm the best i can do all this damage feels Keep my thing up. <laughs> keep, keep it up. And then, and, and his uh, and a uh, like key moment in that was when his bone hall got ping ponged around the uh, oh, uh yes. like pinballed around the thing, hit by everything, pushed through difficult terrain, and uh, ended up on one life at like the back of the uh, like the the room. That was magic. Like it was actually hilarious. the The way that everything was spread out, the way the ice terrain was spread out, the new hazardous pot things that I've thrown on the ground, like look. My bad. And then they pull the the frozen corpses. We call them yetis, right? Because they look like yetis. They pull an attack card that is like a five a five hex attack in a bit of a pyramid from where they are. Yeah. And because of the way they were spread out, they were like shooting it at a group of us, which caused everyone to move back for the next one to go in initiative order to then shoot the same group, to then push them back mm. into over hazardous terrain and all that. For the third one to go in order, it was it was actually hilarious just to watch this all happen. Like it was really sad, especially for Mark, because he had to sit there and the way the horde works, he builds up skeletons in there so that he can actually put these tokens on there for more damage and then take them off yeah. to ignore it and negate it. He was sitting there getting sad because he wants to power them up, but he has to keep removing these tokens. But just the setup of that room and watching everything getting ping ponged around because of this one special rule where everything can push, especially in AoEs. 
Like, look, I loved it. I loved oh, it. Oh, yeah. I love that and, that could happen. And the Yetis would be currently over on their podcast recording now saying like, oh, remember that turn we had where we lined it up perfectly? Oh, we almost killed that bone horde and he bounced around and, you know, I went, then you went, or we just, you know, the synergy. We're, we're the really starting was to get our group the shits now. At us. He was getting all sad. Yeah, yeah. So no, it was it was it was a good moment, and uh, yeah, that room was really enjoyable. There was a, a lot of cool stuff going on. Mm. It was it was fun to be able to. I really finally got a chance to really push and move things around, um, and having mini uh, monsters that we were relatively familiar with that didn't feel too shriek fiendy or snow speakery with their own. You know, everything takes damage and everything gets pushed. And I mean, even though they were doing that. It just mm. felt good. It felt like a really good room to clear mm. and, and set up. And we started to go through our rest cycle and Gaz wanted to go and open the door into the next room. Mm. And we had one Yeti left in the room, actually. We had one left. He was on two on health. On my two health. Two health. And we were like, that's okay. The Horde will get him. And Gaz was like, he announced it. I'm going to go open the door. And we're all like, yep, I'm long resting. I popped my fox. I had my fox next to me. I turned to Mark and I was like, yeah, he's Yeti. He, he, he should get it. Mind you, the horde was on one health, right? It's on one health, mm. and the Yeti was going to do a one attack, another one of the pyramid shots. Mm. And Gaz went to open the door, and before he actually completed his turn of opening the door, I think, um, yeah, Mark really, really needed you to come back and save it. Yeah, and yeah. You I had very uh, conflicted. Well, it, yeah, because. So with the crab, you play these, uh, they're kind of like persistent cards, but they're not, and they go out and they give you little buffs. So the idea is you build up your power as you go, and then when you rest, they all go away, they go back into your discard, you shuffle your cards, and you start again. So you're kind of going through these cycles of like slowly building up power. And I had uh, basically that turn and the next turn, and I had pretty much all my cards out that I wanted to, so that I could do stuff. So I wanted to get two really good turns in the next room, and then I was going to rest, right? And even if it was a long rest, short rest, yeah. Uh, so I was like, that turn, I was going in, because that gives me that turn, plus the attacks from that turn, then the following turn, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, Mark's like, oh, oh yeah, no, nah, my heart's going to die. Yeah. Oh. Um. And so, yeah. And we were it was, all resting. It Pardon? And we were all resting. Oh well, yeah, hundred, yeah. Everyone was resting except for me, who was going in. So and you uh, were I mean, going look, first. You were going first. It was you, then was, the Yeti, yes. and then Mark. Yeah, so he couldn't even save else, himself. Yeah. yeah, so he couldn't do anything. And look, I mean, that's the part of it was. Uh, I mean, you know, looking to win the scenario. Now, the the challenging thing is if uh, the Bone Shaper loses your horde, you can't get it back. It's not like all the skeletons where they just go back into your discard and you just try again later. So being in the first room, not knowing what was in the second room and knowing that Mark was going to lose the Bone Horde, it's a pretty significant loss. It's like losing a main power card that kind of keeps building. So part of that was looking at going, well, all right, this is a pretty important way that we push through these scenarios and we're going to have a look at the DPS meter and you'll see why. <laughs> uh, and... So I kind of was like, all right, well, for the team in regards to us finishing the scenario, it's probably best that I do that. Plus, I didn't want Mark to get all sad panda, right, and lose his favorite toy, yeah. uh, you know, kind of like, you know, 30% into the scenario. Um, so it was a case of like, no, nah, this is fine. But it just did mean that I hit that thing. I don't think I killed it, but because I drew a minus two, remember? Yeah, that's right. You yeah, did I was like, two okay, I'll do two this and I'll hit Pierce, it. And you were so excited. Yeah, well, because it had shields. I was like, okay, it's got shields. I've got PS2. They're like, I, I, I can't not kill it, right? Yeah. Uh, no, apparently minus two means you don't kill it. Uh, but the it because of that, it then focused me. So it hit me and not the own horde. Uh, because if I had done that and the bone horde died anyway, it would have been hilarious. <laughs> but like, oh well, I guess the that's fated. So. Uh, yeah, I end up ended up staying there, and then we killed it, and uh, and kind of moved in. Yeah, like, you know, next and we time. we were we were having a chat a little bit after this about you know, like playing conservatively, keeping everything back, feeding into it, or sending it out on its merry kind of way. Do you think Mark played too aggressively with the bone? Like, is it possible to be reckless with it early in a scenario? It's it's a tricky one because it's really hard to know what's going to target what, right? And mm. he got super unlucky with uh, 
how it got ping ponged around on that turn because it took five, six, seven damage or lost tokens or whatever happened to it. And that was because it got hit so many times. Mm. In saying that, if it's not in that front line, it, none of that happens to it. So mm. it's a tricky one. And we talked about this uh, a while ago that, you know, yeah, you can get unlucky, but it's usually the decisions you make to get there that cause that. Mm. So I feel like because it, it, and it hits like a truck, right? Like when it gets going, it hits like a truck. It, it can take a really big amount of damage. Like it wants to get hit for large amounts of damage because then when you spend a token, it's not as bad. Getting hit for ones and twos, not good for it because it whittles it down, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, I feel like, yeah, there's probably a, a chance to be a bit more cautious with it early on mm. and uh, and see how that plays. But it's tricky because, uh, you know, I'm sure when he moved it into the places he was looking at, it didn't look particularly dangerous. No, no. And I mean, you kind of don't factor in that they're going to – you forget some of the ability cards, right? You've, I mean, even then we had snow imps that can multiple target. We didn't actually get any of those, right? They were doing yeah. strengthening and muddling and all sorts of stuff like that. So we they could have easily have targeted multiple and then shot and then pushed everyone back and done something very similar. So all the monsters there had a, an opportunity to do that. The other thing was, at this point when we did deal with that, you still, it hit you back because you were hitting it. It hit you. You didn't take any damage. You were on your way to getting your second mastery. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And you were feeling so good about it too. Yeah, well, because after the errata from somebody sent through or somebody mentioned, I don't know, somehow between the last episode or last scenario when I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't do it because I got retaliated and now uh, someone pointed out, no, it's just attack damage, take no attack damage, but be attacked at least five times. I'm like... Oh, cool, easy straight. Like this is done. Let's let's lock this one in. And yeah, I was I was well on my way. It was like the fourth or fifth attack, I think. Mm. Actually, I reckon that was the fifth one. I reckon that was the last one because I went in. No, you need you, ne you needed to be hit in the second room. I oh, did. I you made a okay. point. Right. You made a point of doing it because you actually opened the door, and we start. Oh, I opened the door actually on the next turn, and we started to make our way in, and mm. we immediately got swarmed. Right, everything yep, in there. Yep. Same same creatures. They all came in. And everyone was trying to work out how to get in, but it was a bloody conga line going on. Yeah. And you went in and played three cards that were all defensive cards in the hopes that you were going to get hit. Mm. And then the skeletons played like shield and heal or something like that. And the snow imps played strengthen and muddle. And you were like, wow, I've just played three defensive cards and mm. nothing is hitting me. Yep. yep. Um, but yeah, no, the second room it was... Second room was really... Not difficult, it was awkward because everyone wanted to get in for various reasons. Phil kept making weird <laughs> hints about wanting to hit certain creatures. And we kept running into issues of this is the room where we did something we haven't done in a long time and started to teamwork. But in order to do that, we had to talk. So there was a bit where I was going to punt something and I was like, I need to punt something. I need to punt this. And Phil was like, oh, no. And then I was like, okay, I'll punt this. And then Mark was like, oh. And I was like, okay, guys, I'm punting something, okay? I'm not just not going to punt something. And then Gaz piped up and said something on, along the lines of, you know, how about when we're planning the round, not only we usually plan where we want to be, how about we plan a little bit more like, see this guy, I'm going to punt him. Is anyone feeling like, and we just mm. talk about that because – like Phil also needs people in certain positions. I need people in certain positions. You are looking to hit something that's within range. Same thing with Mark. So if we communicate that a little bit more in this cooperative game, we may all yeah. be happy except for Phil. Yeah. Well, we can enable each other, right? Like it's not, I'm going to go at this initiative and I'm going to do four damage to this thing and poison him. It's just like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go after this guy. Right. And that way, and especially with you, and now Phil, who are not only putting terrain down, moving things around, and just, just generally controlling the battlefield a lot more than we've kind of had in our previous uh, classes, I think saying, hey, I'm going for that guy is a good hint because if anyone's like, oh, I was going to make him not be there anymore, mm. right, then at least you can go, well, I'm going to do that. And they're like, okay, cool. Well, I'll go do something else. Because mm. I think normally there's a lot of options. Right, Definitely. like it's not like there's a lack of options, but it's good to know, especially when 
I mean, it's probably me who's more flexible than say you because your a lot of your things to do cool shit. It's very situational. Mm. Where I'm just like, I get to play three cards, so I can really do whatever I want. So if I'm like, yeah, oh, cool, I was gonna go get that guy, and you're like, yeah, that guy's probably not gonna be there. I'd be like, okay, cool, well, I'll go find someone else to hit. I totally agree. I, I do you think that there is a situation where we don't tell exactly what we're doing because we want to keep it a surprise because then it looks cooler if we don't reveal. That sometimes goes through my head, I'll be honest with you. So mm. if I see a trap or some hazardous terrain and I happen to have the right cards in my hand and I'm like, oh, wait till the guys see this, mm. right? That's actually what goes through my head. I like mm -hmm. to, and this is obviously a flaw in the way I'm approaching the game from a teamwork point of view in that I'm still working with a team. I want to win and do the objective with the team, mm. but I want to do it on my own, doing my bit and without talking about it so much. So if I see an opportunity mm. and I'm sitting there racking my brains, I'm like, oh, this looks cool, cool. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to do it. And then it's going to be like, wow, Denny, that was awesome. Yeah. Right? But I run the risk of fucking up someone else's turn. Yeah, and, and that's it's a, it's a good point because... Like, I think there was one turn that Phil got really sad about me hitting a certain thing, so I didn't hit it, and I went and hit something else. And then on his turn, he just hit it. Like, he didn't do anything interesting with it. It was just like, oh, no, but I hit two targets this way. So it's like, okay, hang on. <laughs> so you you were like, oh, do that uh, noise that people do <laughs> when, <laughs> like, that, you know. And I'm like, okay, that's just you trying to get on the meters. But... I get what you're saying is that you do want those things to be a surprise when you do something cool. Uh, and so uh, I guess that's where the co-op, not co-op type part comes in. Uh, I think, I think though, if you uh, like, I don't know, if you just want to try to make sure that the right things happen, then it's probably communicating more. If you're not going to get upset, if something goes wrong, mm. that's the problem. So I, I think, yeah, just talking through it. I think the problem is, is that, Sometimes it might be, oh, I'm not going to tell anyone I'm going to do this cool thing and then play on cards. And then someone has their turn like, oh, whoa, 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 please don't do that thing that you were going to do. And it's like, okay, you can't do both of those. Yeah, You can't hide it from everybody and yeah. go, I'll just see what happens. And then when the things don't go your way, be like, can you not do your turn because I want to do my cool turn? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, if you told me that beforehand, right? then I could have done something else. And that's, that's where that gets tricky. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's fine. I mean, everyone wants to do cool shit, but um, I don't know. It's kind of better <laughs> when it's a surprise. Yeah. That's why I love one of my cards goes at eight. Cause I think there was like, there was dark up and Mark was like, well, maybe I might eat the dark. And I was like, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to eat the dark. He's like, Oh, okay. Well maybe. And, and then I looked at my card. I'm like, it goes at eight. I'm going first. Like, <laughs> Yeah. So it's kind of cool having an eight because then I it do, I don't have to go, mm, I wonder if I'm going to go before these people. No, it's never a surprise. The thing that happened with Phil, I remember as well, is that there were two skeletons left or something and he still had to kill one of them. And one of them was next to him and we had left it for him in a way thinking, we didn't think too much on it. You pulled over your attack modify card and it added in target. And That's then you right. were like... Oh, I can also hit that. And then he went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get that as a sound bite. That's just a, like, that means that someone has seen something that they're not happy with. Yeah. It actually happened <laughs> we'll a lot. We just play it on our phones. It happened we'll a lot. Phones, so, like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, Room 2 was, it was fun. It was actually really fun. It felt really tight and, and claustrophobic. But then we got the horde in there and the horde started whacking stuff really hard as it does. Um, and you know, I managed to get the wolf in there. Oh, actually during one of these turns, see, this, this is the problem also when I don't decide my own pushes or pulls. Cause sometimes I'm like, I'm going to move this. And everyone's like, if they accept that I'm going to move it, they want to decide where it goes. And I have two people, two different people saying, no, no, no. Can you put it over here? And I'm like, I'm pushing it. Mind you, I do say, I don't really care where I'm pushing it. I'm just pushing it to get it out and, mm. and push it really far away. And then I get Mark saying, oh, can you put it over here so my guy can get to it? And Gas is like, no, put it over here. And I'm, in the end, I just go with whatever. But that one decision caused my dog to die because my dog ended up closer in initiative than just another spot. Uh, and okay. I remember on a future turn, might have even been in the same turn because I wasn't really thinking about it. So it's, you know, my fault as well. Um, whatever I pushed came back and just punched my dog and hit it for like 
five or six. Um, and my, my fox died. And I was immediately like, oh, yeah, I get sad. And like, not like Mark's sad because my whole build's not based around it, but <laughs> like, it's still a big DPS loss for me. And it, what, mitigates once, unlike his skeletons. Yeah, well, it was funny because there was a, uh, like there was a massive amounts of controversy over in that one because it, so there's two doors right just for people playing at home who haven't seen it there's basically two entrances and they're at kind of opposite sides of uh oh, this corridor yeah um yeah and i chose to go because of that cluster that and congo line that uh daddy was talking about earlier uh i went up right i went one way in that side and everyone else crammed in the other side and what was happening actually is because everything pushes every time it hits you we were we went right in and we got pushed all the way back out right so it was a bit funny but i was just kind of standing up there watching while you were talking about moving and punting and pulling um you know phil's like i don't want you to do that uh mark's like oh can you put it over here or this guy's here or move that there and i'm like i'm glad i'm not part of this Mm. like it's it's so stressful and then (laughs) Then at the end of it, you finally got all the way through it and it was like, oh, he's out of range. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I had two moments of that. So uh, this was, it was in the, just this, this... so funny that there was so many opinions on what should happen. And then you're like, yeah, I didn't read the card. I didn't read the card. I did and read it, it multiple times. Not just I didn't read the card. It's like, but normally my cards say this. Yeah. Like... <laughs> Yeah. What yeah. do you mean it's only pool one or pool two or something? Yeah, like I didn't that. understand. So we ended we, we, we basically finished room two. We went to room three, which is where, where Gaz is talking about. And this is the part where we finally got the new rules, right? And to set the story, kind of we've got some skeletons, we've got some more yetis, we've got some more snow imps, we've got some more ice, more hazardous terrain, and there's an ice wraith. All right, there's an ice ice wraith chilling on the far side of the board. And when I saw that, I was like, ooh. That's awesome. We haven't seen, we've only seen these once, I think. Um, in twice, that, in I that. think, but. Pardon? Yeah. I think twice. Oh, okay. Um, and in the middle, there's a glowing orb, and there's always a glowing orb. And this is a glowing orb that's called an anchor of some kind. And it has something like 28 health or 30 health or something. And ultimately, we need to keep it alive. And everything, it's an ally to us, so everything's going to attack it. And we can lose cards, so we can negate through. Um, damage to it from getting rid of a card. And then the Ice Wraith is also called a Rhyme Heart, and it has a lot more health than a standard Ice Wraith, and it's immune to Disarm and Stun. And then it was like, get in. Let's go and do this. And Gaz is right. I, I kind of pop birds, went in nice and early, got kicked out almost immediately <laughs> because of the ice and the push. And this happened twice. So I, I then realized that because of all the creatures that are in there, and they're all going to focus on the orb, all they have to do is play super defensive and kick us out every time we try and get inside. Yeah, <laughs> that's their yeah. win condition, and it was so far it was working. Yeah, and and I, it's actually funny when you started explaining that. I realized that I was linking room one and room two together, or room two uh, and room three together. I completely forgot there was a second room. So when I was sorry, when I was talking about there being of, two entrances, yeah. yeah, that the corridor I was talking about was going in there. So yeah, that makes more sense now. But uh, that's where I was in the third room. I was at the top, kind of where you guys were at the bottom or yes. left right. But I was trying to get past the halfway point because when they push me, right, they'll push me away. So if I could get past the halfway point of the room, they'd push me more into the room rather than out. Yeah. But I just couldn't make it. No. <laughs> Every time I kept moving forward and then they're like, oh, we're just going to see ya, but, see ya. But Mark was coming behind you. So you kept, once he got to the point where That's he was right. in the doorway, he was stopping you from going outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, sorry, I got you, bro. Back in there, right? <laughs> yes. Back in there. It's kind of like Fight Club. Like, there was a big circle and I just kept getting pushed out and like, no, you're back in. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it was. this is the room where I spent a long time looking at all the ice and everything and Mark's horde was in the bottom door with me and we were like, I was saying to him, hey, if I can get the, you know, if I can bring with a big pool the Ice Wraith, all the way to us, uh, Horde and Ice Wraith can duke it out. And that'll be great. We just finish everything else off. And yep. and that'll be great. So I spent ages planning it. And Phil was like, can I go stand over there to do something? He did some eruption thing with creating three more hazardous t- uh, tile pieces uh, in the area. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. There's so much stuff to pull things through. So I'm going to plan everything. And I'm telling Phil, Phil's like, can I go there? And I'm like, no, you can't go there. And he's like, okay. What about if I go there? And I'm like, no, I'm pulling through there. You can't just go away. 
like go somewhere else. And he was like, <laughs> look, he was having a rough time. So he, he then wanted the head towards the other direction and he showed me where he wanted to go. And I was like, no, I need that area too. And I didn't, but um, it was really triggering him. <laughs> and we planned this whole round around me wanting to pull this guy. And guys, it's right. I, I pulled a card that literally, I had another card that says pull three and it would have been enough to grab him, but the range was a little bit shorter. And the one with range could only pull it two. So after setting everything up and fucking with Phil and just saying, go away, do your own thing. I went to do my amazing turn and I stopped. And as I'm moving the boss, I'm like one, two. And I'm looking at the card because it says two. And I really needed it to say three. <laughs> and I stopped for a second. I zoom in on the card right up to my face. And then I look at Gaz. And Mark's looking at me. Everyone's looking at me. And the room is quiet. <laughs> and I've just gone, ooh, I may have fucked this up. And Mark was like, read the card, read the card. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. I have 100% screwed this up. So I had to put the ice rate back. And it was a real big egg on my face kind of situation because I had wasted Phil's time. I wasted my own time. I ended up pulling a Yeti forwards, actually. So it wasn't completely bad. I just threw a Yeti in front of the horde so that he could eat that. Mm. And then the next turn, I was like, no, I got it this time. I got it this time. I've worked it out. I've worked it out. I've even moved slightly closer so I can do this. And I pick my two cards. We've done the initiative. And I'm ready to pull Ice Wraith straight to the Yeti. Only to then look at the card the actual ability card of the Ice Wraith, and I saw the wing. So it's like wing and then four. Mm. So that's its movement. But wing means it flies. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, it's flying, isn't it? And everyone kind of looked at the screen and was like, yeah, almost like, of course it is. But at the time that I said it, everyone had to look at the screen for confirmation. Mm. It wasn't auto. And then I realized it wasn't going to be affected by, A, the icy terrain or the hazardous terrain that I was going to bring it across. Mm. So I cracked the shits. And I brought another Yeti over um, <laughs> to, 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 to the, to the hoard because I was just so, so over it. And then it became literally a, a game of, you know, you're trying to keep everyone in, hoard's doing work, Phil's complaining and whinging over in the corner. Like, Phil... Well, because he, he was on... He moved somewhere and then just got the crap kicked out of him and poisoned <laughs> and he wanted heals. And corner. everyone was kind of like, yeah, we heals later. Like, yes. heals later. And we were, he was getting really upset about it. But he also had to kill like a Yeti or something. He did, yeah. So his battle goal was to kill one of every monster type, which yeah. was going to be really hard with a, a a boss type in there, right? Like the Ice Wraith. Uh, but so he well, needed really to hard kill if a Yeti. you miss out on one of the monsters. <laughs> yeah, well that's it as well. So he had he had there was one Yeti left and it was on kind of low life, and then Mark mm -hmm. killed it. Yeah, it was near the horde. The horde had its yeah. turn. I think it beat up a snow imp. Or a skeleton. Yep. There was one there. Yeah. And then Mark played a card that granted it a move and attack. Mm. Philip was not paying attention at this time. No. We all knew he needed the uh, the Yeti. The Yeti, yeah. I have spoken to Mark since, and he claims he did not know he needed it. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Um, And I said, oh, I it's funny, because the... we were talking about it a lot throughout the whole thing. I, I thought the, like, haha, I don't care comment afterwards <laughs> <laughs> implied that he knew but didn't care. Yeah, look. Yeah. <laughs> So he, right. he he basically hit it for nine and it just died. Yeah, Phil I hadn't noticed died. yet. On video, I'm clearly like shocked. Like, oh my God, he just did that. And yeah. I just looked and you're looking at me and you're like, what's wrong? And I'm just like, just, just, just wait. It's going to happen. And then Phil looks up and goes, ah. <laughs> just, he just implodes. And Mark has the smuggest look on his face. And I've never seen this game go from cooperative to just, just, Teamwork implosion um, in a split second, just like that. Because well, what... instantly Phil started looking through his cards to work out how he could fuck Mark. <laughs> yes. Right? No. Like, it was basically just a, okay, cool. What can I do to make sure that I make his life hell? Yeah. He was trying to make Mark fake, fail his battle call, to which Mark yeah. said, no, you can't. <laughs> He's <laughs> you like, can't. you can't. It's all up to me, mate. Then basically Phil turned around and headed towards the entrance of the dungeon back where we started and he was picking up loot along the way. He, he had yes, yeah, stuff you guys, I'm it. going home. Yeah. Yep. He absolutely cracked it. And then the remaining of us, yeah, we, we were basically picking off everything else. The orb was looking pretty good. It was just this bloody ice wraith that we had to deal with. Yeah, and at the back of the room, there was a lot of icy terrain, yeah. difficult terrain, corners, bits and pieces. It was really tricky to get around. Mm. Uh, 
The thing that I was worried about, which was my battle goal, was to have five or less cards in my discard or hand, which I thought was going to be fine. But then because we couldn't, like, I think other than the Horde, nothing could get near the Ice Wraith. So I'm like, I'm going to spend like five turns just waiting for this thing to die. Well, also, he went invisible when you were really planning uh, on it. Yeah, there was a turn where we were planning on dealing with it and he happened to go invisible and then we had to try and go late. Mm. Um, so which we did. We did really well. Yeah. We did really well. Um, so yeah, we, we did kill him. It was funny leading him. up towards the end because we still had to try and get the horde close enough. It was still in a good 20 health. It was going to take a few rounds. I had no damage on me. All of my top cards and all my damage cards were gone. This thing does not care about difficult, uh, hazardous terrain. Um, I had very few toys. All I could do was move it around a little bit to help out with its positioning. And I was just sitting there going, I can't contribute to the damage. Gaz was struggling with positioning. We had the horde on it. Um, and I just made a comment and just said, like Phil does damage, and you were like, "Yeah, but he's in the first room. He's back. At the, yeah, he's back he's at gone the start. home, mate. <laughs> like he's already in the Uber. He's gone. Yeah. He's left the left the building. Like, and I just started running around picking up loot. I went back in the hallway to pick up loot. You were picking up loot, and then mm. we basically on the very last turn killed it. And then Mark picked up a piece of loot, and it meant there was only one card left <laughs> in the loot deck. So <laughs> Phil finally makes it back to the front room. And he sets up uh, on the same turn as Mark, just later, sets himself up so that he could a do loop a loop one. one and grab two tokens. And he just looks up at the screen and goes, hey, does the one mean there's only one loot, one loot card <laughs> left? And Mark was like, yeah. And he's like, wow. <laughs> and Mark just found a way to screw him again <laughs> right at the end. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So he's been screwed over the whole night. He's gone, stuff you guys. I'm going home. And then he's gotten home and realized that Mark has actually used the last of his credit um, on his Uber account and he can't even order himself a cheeseburger. Just absolutely taking oh. all the stuff. Like, oh, talk about God. cutting grass, right? But um, I didn't even know. I mean, I do know because I remember it, we talked about it in the very first scenario, but I didn't even realize we could get to the end of the loot pile. No, we've never we've never been able we, to. Yeah, and hey, what's hilarious is we've got to the end of it, and this is one that doesn't have a secret chest or an extra chest. Oh which no, it's just so sad because we always miss those, and yeah, yeah, no, we, no, we managed to get everything. Everyone stayed alive. What were your thoughts on scenario sixty five? Yeah, it was good fun. It was good fun. It was uh, it was weird for positioning, but it was it. It had enough cool stuff in it. Enough. Uh, stuff for everyone to do. I feel like our class makeup is weird for it. Like with you and Phil both wanting to spew up crap everywhere, right? The fact that most of all of the rooms had crap everywhere uh, made it more challenging. Yeah. But, but in saying that, because of the ice and the way you guys move things around, then again, it kind of lent into it a bit. So it was kind of a little bit of both. I did point out though, once we had finished that we hadn't really placed much. Um, Phil did the three tiles at the very end um, and then maybe one or two near the actual start, but he did that when we were well past it. So it wasn't really, he was just using it for a buff or something like mm -hmm. that. And I placed two in the very start room, none in the middle. And then two after we had already decided we were going to beat the boss just mm -hmm. to um, get elements up or something like that. So we, we weren't spewing them up. The the map had definitely had heaps there, but that was part of the map gimmick. It was yeah. definitely going to be because of all the ice that was yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And I, I, I look, I love this scenario. I thought it was so much fun. Um, obviously, because it, it suits my play style of just yeah. things being moved everywhere and, and the puzzle of what can go where, but also the ice carrying it further and seeing all the extra damage you could do from it um, just changed it up for me a lot. And I really, really liked that. So is this why you hate spatial puzzles? Because you fail them twice? Uh, look, that's different. That's just me not reading <laughs> cards, which normally I feel like I'm all right, at, all right at. We all have our moments. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We we saw, yeah, that's you You said that to me. And then it, everyone was like, yeah, you know, you, you have this massive turn, you play three cards, and at the end of it, we calculate how much damage you did in that round. It's like one. Yeah. You know? And that's essentially what that turn was for me because it, so, it was so busted. Mm. I like, I Actually, like, yeah. One of the, it's not related to the scenario, but I just remember it because I otherwise forget. But the other thing we got was that, uh, I don't know, technology wasn't working or phones weren't working. So we had our uh, Patreon exclusive 
daddy reading the <laughs> scenario. That's right. And doing voices. <laughs> yeah, look, that was terrible. Um, everyone um, laughed a bit. And yeah, yeah, and oh no, well that's a rude offender. I probably shouldn't say that. Okay, I'll um, we'll talk more about that in raw. Yeah, after okay, dark, whatever it's called. Yeah, the um, I've, I've got a recording of the voices. I've got some of. Yeah, them. and. And for those that want to subscribe, we can put a Patreon up and, and you can have Daddy will go through and read every single road event and uh, you can play it and have the same voice for every character that you meet. Mate, I'll charge them to take it. It is so bad. Don't don't talk yourself down. No, you all laughed at me. It yeah, didn't, it, it it didn't la- stop me. It didn't stop. We're laughing with you. <laughs> yeah. That old just that. Yeah. Is this a normal scenario? Oh, I think Ormi would go for a ride. Like, I reckon he he'd would go for a be few all over the place. Yeah. Like, he'd be like a, uh, I don't know, uh, he, he'd, get, he'd get clapped. It's just purely from the AOE. I think he'd get in but, trouble. Although, because he follows Monster AI, he won't, oh no, he'll still step on the um, on the, the ice. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it would be bad. Because, mm. yeah. He'd, he'd have to try. Yeah, no, I don't, not a good good one at all. Um, I looked into the two player one. It you have less creatures. Um, like in the, in the first room, you know, you have an elite, I don't know, skeleton, two two snow imps, and one normal yeti. Like mm. it seems like the difficulty is just based on how many creatures are in there. It doesn't yeah. seem too much like it was scaling in a weird way. But, I mean, those scenarios are the ones that, like Torf said, are very fragile. So, obviously, if you're getting a really good attack off in the hopes of killing something and you miss, it's going to set you back a lot. Mm. Well, I mean, like uh, the scenario 69, this one wasn't that difficult. Like, I didn't feel like there was at any point, really, we are in a lot of trouble. So, to kind of cruise through. Um, and, I mean, how much of that is uh, luck and how much of it is by design, I don't know. But... It did feel long. Oh, it did. I didn't it go for like 18 like rounds or something like that? Yeah, or was it that went the last for a one? very, I don't remember. It went very long. Yeah, it took. It did take a while and we did finish quite late, but it still didn't feel hard. No, 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 no I agree with you. I think the, um, if we had lost the horde, it would still be doable and that may be where the challenge comes in. Yeah, we talked about that, right? Like if we'd lost the horde in that first room then I think we still do it, but it definitely becomes a lot harder. Mm. Like we, we change, have to change a lot of what we do because it depends yeah, on how much Mark checks both... out, right? Pardon? Depends on how much Mark checks out. That's true. You actually. Can still well, I mean, it becomes a, a three player scenario. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it'd be interesting. I mean, technically also Phil would be in that last room most likely. And then also throwing out a lot of damage. So rather than in the first room collecting loot. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, all oh, right, so no sixty five in the books. Um, Phil missed Watch. Watch. Did, did he miss? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. I can't remember. I don't think he missed. I don't think he missed. No, he just drew red cards. Yeah, look, I need to talk to you guys because during the recording, when I went back to watch it, both Mark and Phil were drawing cards behind things, and I just couldn't see it, so I couldn't oh. actually see for the miss watch. Okay. Mm. Okay. So we need a dedicated camera on to our modifier decks now. That's what I'm hearing. No, just move crap out of the way and stop. Oh, you know, okay. Back to that in. Doesn't so, sound very high tech. No, no, it's basic. Let me. Uh, battle goals. So we already found out what Phil's was. He had exterminated, kill one or more of each monster type that appears in the scenario. Quite just, a tricky just one. Just on to that have. one. Just yeah. on that one. Okay, and his choice. He was complaining at the start of the scenario that. He, because he's trying to get this three ticker, right? He's trying to get three ticks so he can get the upgrade that means that his difficult terrain that he throws out, we don't take damage from because it would be really useful. Yes. So he feels like he's doing us a favor by that, doing that. It's like, okay, cool. So by not making our lives worse, you feel like you're doing us a favor. Sure. But it's three ticks. So it's a big investment. He was complaining that he keeps getting these really bad ones. And I'm pretty sure that you said before we started, you went through the remainder of the uh, the deck, the battle goal deck. And for those that don't remember, we're doing a slight variant where anytime we complete a battle goal, we're putting it in a separate pile to take out. So we're kind of going through 
and we're down to the dregs of the deck and we're doing probably some of the harder ones. <laughs> Which is why some of them that, are repeating themselves. They're coming yeah. back up. But he was like, oh, I can't do any of these. They're all too hard for me, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm pretty sure you said that you guys went through and went like 80% of them you can do. Oh, yeah. And then on his choice, now I don't know what his other two were, so I can't, maybe they were hard, but he's picked a two ticker. And I've seen that one. And that one's tricky because if you get any unique or you get any, like, oh, there's only one or two of these mobs, that's coming down to you having to kill these. Which we did. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, well, I don't really have any sympathy for you. If you keep choosing no. really hard battle goals, don't complain you can't do them. No, I 100% agree with you. Um, look, that's that's where the greed kicks in, right? And, you know, two tickers are very enticing. There's still quite a few in there. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of how much you're going to book the scenario potentially or how much you, um, yeah, or they're just too hard to achieve. Yeah. I mean, I worked that out for myself, and that's not a, a rule applicable for everybody, that I was failing the two tickers more often than I was succeeding them. And therefore, I was far better off just to pick the one tickers. Because mm. I was going in a, a case of like where I'd be like, do the one ticker, do the one ticker. Oh, I'll grab the two ticker and I'll try and do that fail. And then next one, get the, do the one ticker. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm behind because I'm not actually achieving these. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's super situational. Yep. Yeah. Very much so. Mark had Wastrel, which he's had in the past. Um, lose the card to, to negate two or less damage from an attack. Um, he himself, unfortunately, wasn't taking damage from attacks. Um, it was mostly into his pets. Um, if it was just take damage from eating his face. And oh, losing it, just yeah. had a thought. Yeah. We could discard cards to avoid taking damage in the orb. Yeah. Does it say avoid taking damage from yourself? Uh, that is... An excellent question. Lose a card to negate two or less damage from an attack. That sounds yeah. like one for Dwarf. I think you're already yeah. compiling a small list of battle goal uh, rules clarifications. That's it. I've got every battle goal listed on a spreadsheet, and I've got questions and a rider for each of them, Dwarf. So just look out for that. Yeah. It's coming in the mail. Yeah. Well, we won't say anything. We'll just see whether or not he just happens to listen and mention to us on Monday. Yep. Uh, Gaz, as you mentioned, you had Streamliner, so I have five or more total cards in your hand and discard pile at the end of a scenario, which you did get. Mm -hmm. uh, you were close to booking it because of, I was on five cards. Yeah, because of the yeah. invis round, you got mm -hmm. a bit close. And I had layabout, gain seven or fewer XP before any bonus scenario experience. Which, at the very start, I was just like, "Look, this is going to hold me off XP," um, but it is a two ticker, and like. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do it. And I don't have to spend a lot of XP, like generate a lot of XP from cards. My persistence, whether or not I'm going like Chilling Impact, will give me two. The dog will give me two. Um, the one that punts everyone for four, that gives me one. That's kind of it. So I had a lot of more control over it. I just didn't want to use anything big. Uh, and there's like a bit where the ward, I have the ward one. If I consume air, it beefs up the, the, the heal that goes with that and gives me an XP. So... A lot of elemental ones where the elements were up, I just was choosing not to um, to get those when they were there. So, so I sat on seven by the very end. And that's half the reason why in the very last room also, I was like, I uh, don't know what else to use at the moment because I didn't want... That's also the reason I didn't play Top Birds, um, which is something I do at the very end yeah. um, for XP. But no, and, I got it. And how many XP did you end off from end up away from level? Three. Yeah. <laughs> So I like when, when he told us that I was like, really, you've chosen, to, I mean, two ticks is a big thing and you're also in no rush to level up really, because you're going to be playing the snowflake for about the next 11 billion like scenarios. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's probably in, in hindsight, but I was just like, Oh, I can't believe you chose to finish three XP behind the level. Like, that's such a, oh, the willpower there. Yeah. It's just, I think the perks are more important. They just. The further along the perk thing I get, if I get to a point where I've filled them all out, I don't have to think about them anymore. I'm happy with that. All right. All right. DPS meters. Oh, my God. So, this was fairly disgusting in the DPS um, meter thing because at the very end of the game, we had to play the prices right, and that was with Mark's damage. So, 
Phil actually asked, you know, how much do you think Mark did? And we started doing a prices right style bidding around the table. I went like 92 or something. Gaz went 110 or something. Uh, Mark went 120 or something like that. I can't remember. Um, if we take away damage blocked, and we are counting over damage, by the way. So if we do excess <clears throat> damage. Yeah, that was the big thing. Uh, and it's never really popped up because we haven't had to think about it. But this one was the one that raised that as being a uh, more obvious because he had its situations where the horde was hitting things on one, two, three health for seven, right? Seven or eight, which I mean is is usually it doesn't really matter because it's over a over a scenario, but I think it added up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It it really did. So basically, uh we'll go in damage from the chart that I've actually got here. So in terms of damage, I on the snowflake hit forty three. This is also effective damage. I'm no longer Big doing damage. the minus anymore. So 43, which was the most I've done on the snowflake. So that was yeah, that, that felt huge. really, really, really good. Guys had 18 and he hit 30 times. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> he had 30 instances of attacking. Yeah, um, like I believe. How, how's that, guys? Like, what's the going shields, on? man. It's just the shields. The shields and the okay. minus ones that you just kept pulling. Oh, there's so many minus ones. <laughs> Phil finished on 28. Would have been higher, but he took his ball and went home. <laughs> and Mark finished on 130. And if we don't, if we count, this is effective damage. If it's not effective damage, it ended up on 157, mm. which was just like, like that's two Death Walkers running around right now. Yeah, like, I know. I know. That's it. Uh, that was absolutely nuts. So yeah, Horde, when allowed to do its thing and kept alive, and he granted attacks as well. And if you can funnel those skeletons into it, it hits like a truck. Yeah, yeah, big damage. Yeah, and look, it was. It was just munching things by the end. It was just like you were bringing, pulling in yetis. It was just yeah, like, oh, I was just oh, feeding it. Oh, yeah. Um, tanking. So, or well, damage taken. So I had 19. Gaz took 24. Phil took 20. And Mark took 57. And this coincides a lot with what was mitigated. So usually mitigated is either through a shield or through negating through a discard or a loss card. Um, I had negate, mitigated nothing. Gaz mitigated 14. Phil mitigated nothing. And Mark mitigated nine. So I don't really know how that makes sense because he would have taken a lot more damage, right? And removed tokens so each time. Nine. Yeah, unless he's done... That's Unless he's done the graph. I gave him the stats and he made the graph. So, you know what? I'm okay. We'll just keep it like that because it looks terrible. <laughs> and then we have uh, healing. So I finished on 23. I included my regens this time. I had my own separate little chart going on the side. No regen for seven altogether. Only using it twice. So I was happy with that. Gaz healed for six. Phil healed for 12. And Mark healed for 20. 65. So... Did Mark top everything? Not healing. I had 23. He had 20. Oh, okay. Okay. He almost topped everything. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, next scenario, he just does by himself and we just chill? Yeah. Or is it is it now it's one DPS, three supports? Um. Yeah. Look, apparently. Apparently. The three supports, I, I'm three tempted to one. see what happens if it dies and then just like, you know, just see what happens, right? Uh, Outpost phase. We had a section event. It was essentially... Uh, the event that's uh, on on the section itself on the calendar. It's the end of summer. Mm. So end that was winter. really... Oh, sorry. End of winter. I literally have end of summer written down. Uh, end of winter. And we head back into summer. And this was a pretty key thing because it actually took a whole bunch of road events and outpost events. And they get now shuffled into their respective decks, which has just made them so much thicker. Mm. So, yeah, it kind of... Makes me a little bit nervous in that there's just so much extra stuff in there, but also really excited because I had no idea what else this game was going to throw at us, especially yep. from an event point of view. So that's exciting. And you would think that the ones that were hiding behind like a time gate, they're locked ones, are going to be more exciting, right? Yeah. They have to be. Have to. We had an outpost event again in the next episode. and the Raw episode, we'll cover that a little bit. Gaz is now not too sure what happened. Um, no, I've completely forgotten. Even though I remembered earlier. So, oh no, no, no! I remember now. I remember now. Yeah. Well, I'll just say for starters, it was an attack. Um, yeah. We definitely got attacked, and this was the the biggest attack we've ever had. Um, oh, it was brutal. Yeah, it we, was brutal. Yeah. 
we had to lose a lot of resources to um and we were we were throwing soldiers at this one and everything and it was kind of like yeah. whoa all right we had a spicy attack for a change which was yeah a good one to finish winter mm. but um along with the event came an xp bonus which gave me the extra xp i needed to level up so mm. i leveled I up well snowflakes now level six how are we in crabland are we five uh i think i'm five yeah so i probably i could do my solo scenario did you just hit five yeah okay uh, Phil would have leveled up surely to maybe three. I'm not too sure what he was running at. And Mark is still nine. He still hasn't still. gone up or down. <laughs> um, I don't remember what we crafted. I think it may have been an upgrade to the craftsman shop or the yeah. something like that. Yeah, it was. Which yep. just gave us a bunch of new items to, to craft, which mm-hmm. some of them look okay. Kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, where to next? So I'm now time getter for six weeks. <laughs> uh, for that so I'm happy to go anywhere else I'm pretty sure Mark wants to take over um, more unfettered yeah which okay. is what we were going to do this time but yep. we'll do that one and as soon as his next one becomes available we'll go do that yeah yeah that probably sounds about right we'll do that yeah Um, two more things one of them is solo scenario daddy so over on our YouTube I have just uploaded a video from me attempting the Snowflake solo scenario at level five, which was before the session when everyone came over. Phil was there with me. Um, I haven't uploaded the whole thing because I think I attempted it three or four times. I've just snipped it up into me talking and when I was playing cards and how the rounds and I've basically sped up most of it. And, and Phil just, arguing with you about rules. I didn't include that. Um, okay. But it's just, it's just basically me um, getting a bit upset um, when they do stupid things. Phil was also in charge of the monster deck, the uh, modifier deck. He never missed. <laughs> what a mistake. He like, never we've missed. We've talked about for 29 episodes how this guy draws positive modifiers and you gave him. <sighs> to be fair, like, mm. I blessed myself and one of my pets, which put two blesses into my deck. And... Um, they somehow went to the top of my deck, so no, okay, <laughs> then, right. then you can see that as well. Don't worry, I'll, I'll come around next time and I'll draw the monster deck and they'll never hit you. That's what someone in the comments said. <laughs> <laughs> they said Gaz should have been the one drawing <laughs> the cards for the yep, monsters. Yep. But yeah, solo scenarios, like I've seen now Phil do his, I've seen Mark do his, I've now attempted mine. I had a really good crack at it. Things were actually going really well my way and then I actually feel like RNG from the monster cards just absolutely cleaned me up and booked me out of nowhere. It was, I'm so determined to do this though. And I just have a feeling someone actually mentioned, um, it could be a level thing. Like then they may not be designed to, to do them at five. Yeah. Um, level five well, difficulty three. So classes have thresholds, right? They have power thresholds because you get new cards. Mm. Like for example, Mark doing a solar scenario now with his bone horde, he probably oh. have a, Easy. like, He'd yeah. probably struggle to lose it. Yeah, that's it. So, uh, I mean, it's probably easy to say, you know, they're all going to be really easy to do at level nine. But I think maybe you might be one card off. Yeah. Like what you need, the the kind of toolkit you need to put together. Yeah. But no, I had a lot of fun doing it and uh, look forward to doing more of them and also recording more of the guys doing theirs um, and just getting a bit better with the the editing and all that kind of stuff. It's It was really fun. I really enjoyed the whole kind of project. Well, I have to work out a time I'll come over and give mine a crack. I'd love that because we already worked out what's in yours. Ah, uh, wave throwers. Wave yeah, well, throwers. Yeah, I think I need to, Um, I think I've almost, I'm saving my ticks up or maybe I've got it, I'm not sure, Uh, to get my two ticker, which is, well, maybe it's a three ticker. I don't know, whatever one gives me advantage when there's basically water under me or the monster. That yeah, might make that'll, easier. that'll be handy. You can slip and slide mm-hmm. all over the place. Uh, and the bag. So uh, dirt bag. We actually received a really cool email from Jeremy. Um, first time contact with us. Uh, he just basically opened up with class suggestions for Mark. And he was like, sounds like Mark would love the trap class, uh, or shackles. If you unlock it in time, trap has absurd, absurd high end, um, and fits the bill of damage dealer with rewarding hoops to jump through sometimes literally. I don't know what that means. It's awesome listening to you guys enjoying the journey. Keep it up. He also followed it up with another Thanks, email. Jeremy. Pardon? Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy's a top bloke. He followed yeah. it up with another one, which is 
I found really interesting. It's like a double bag, double dirt bag. He double dirt bagged. So that's cool. I like that. If a movie was being made about the story of your mercenary party, which plays slash moments would make the trailer? And we've had a little bit of a think of this and we've come up with a couple of kind of key moments in our, in our journey that I think would make into an awesome trailer. Um, and I have a feeling this trailer is also not one that'll end after these moments because there's probably going to be a lot more in the future. Yeah. So starring in our trailer, we've got Danny DeVito playing the drifter um, at the very start. Um, we, we had to pick actors for this, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We've got Danny DeVito. Now, <laughs> who do we pick for the Gemini? Uh, Nicolas Cage. Yep. There's two of and them. And Nicolas Cage. There's two of them. Yeah, yeah, Nicolas Cage both times. The, the, I feel like the, the, I feel like his his range oh, of characters oh is so big that I feel he would be able to play uh, all okay. of the different variants of uh, of the Gemini. Okay, you've you've really thought about that. Yes, that definitely. I think it was it's the right a- amount of uh, acting skill. Uh, ham. Uh, you never know if he's being serious. You don't know what he's doing. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing, and that's just the Gemini in his he, right? Like, oh god. Okay. Um, for the Death Walker, we went with someone who is kind of slow, takes their time, really builds things up, really gets you into it. And then, you know, so we went with Morgan Freeman, yep. which kind of fits the bill. It's, you know, you're rooting for him. He's a lovely guy. You kind of want him to come through and then bang, he just comes through and knocks his socks off, right? Yeah. You want him there all the time, right? Like yeah. he's, he's always going to be quality, but it, you know, it can take a little bit to get started and it always sounds like a long winded kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, conversation or message or that stuff. And, and you don't begrudge him for it, but he definitely always delivers. Yeah. And, uh, we were like, we were saying who would play the bone shaper? Uh, yeah. it has to be someone who is not like they're the star cause they're the main character, but their acting is so bad that they're, they're, they're basically helped up by the supporting cast to make yep. everything a success. Yeah. And you said, yeah. you said, Phil. Phil. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And starring as a pro shaper, <laughs> Phil. Phil. Oh, and then in the, in the trailer, so the very, yeah. Is either, it, it, then I think we decide that Phil maybe isn't famous enough. No. So who was your alternative? If Phil wasn't available for the movie, yeah. right? We couldn't get him or we couldn't get in touch with his agent yeah. or he didn't like the script. Who would be our backup uh, bone shaper? Oh, I went with Kevin Cosner. <laughs> I think that he's a classic example of someone who's, you know, not, not the best actor, but his movies do well because of everyone around him and the support cast, right? Which is what a bone shaper does, right? Bone shaper doesn't really do much, but... You know, he's made he's made effective by the people around him that help him act, <laughs> help That's him fair. get through. Sure, why not? Help him with his accents. So he doesn't sound the same in every single movie. <laughs> so the actual trailer itself, uh, I've picked, we've sort of alternating with some of the scenarios and moments. I kind of can't forget the very beginning, and I think it suits the very beginning of the trailer where it's kind of explaining, you know, this party of mercenaries feeling very cocky and really excited They've heard about the heroics of Gloomhaven and they're going on their very own adventure through Frost, Frosthaven. And in that very first scenario, you know, you got the drifter, you got the whole party there and these Algox archers are there and you can hear the cockiness coming out of the drifter's mouth. He's like, don't worry, I've got this. And he just heads down the back and immediately gets booked by three archers and discards cards, like cards fall out of his hand onto the ground. And he's just like, oh, and he's just lying there like, this is going to be much harder like than we, we anticipated to signify that Frosthaven is no joke and it's no walk in the park compared to Gloomhaven. What did you yeah. have? Yeah, so I, I went with a, another another scene and I'm, I'm picturing it. Uh, we we open the open the door and there's the gurgling sound and and this uh, is yeah. a uh, this is a movie where you know you recognize that sound. You're like, what's that sound from? We've heard that sound before. What's what is it? And it kind of pans all the way at the end of this really long corridor, which is going to take a while to move down. <laughs> and there is a single ooze. <laughs> and it's like the villain returns. It's like the, the ooze. Blob. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And as soon as we see it, we all know 
Ooh, that's going to take a while to get to. We know what cards they've got, so yeah. I think that would be a good reveal. Yeah, except Gemini never made it to the ooze, so... Gemini was dead by the time <laughs> yes. the ooze came out, so he doesn't know it. That's part of the horror, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely Scenario 10. Scenario 10 just has to be there because it was such a climatic. It just felt like a final boss at the end of... It was in episode 9 in in this, in this one of the seasons of the show. It was episode 9, which is usually the cliffhanger one where everything's about to go down. And it was this big smoky plane. There's these pillars of strength that are giving all of these Algox and these Algox bodies everywhere. And then you've got this mutilated corpse. Well, not corpse, actually. You were still alive, technically. You're just exhausted. And you're lying on the floor. The Geminis is lying there in two pieces, both Nicolas Cage. They're just lying there, just acting wounded. Like, he could yep. do that, right? Yeah. And then you've got a really, really wounded, but still upright, uh, Danny DeVito and, <laughs> and Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, and in front of him, you got a really wounded priest on four health, and they're all looking at each other, and it's the last round of scenario ten, and everyone's playing their cards, <laughs> and Yu-Gi-Oh style. Morgan Freeman, like you know, the things flash across the screen, and he pulls this card out like Yu-Gi-Oh, and he throws his card, Deathwalker style, straight into the last priest's face, and he falls down, and we make it out alive, and we we drag Nicholas Cage and Nicholas Cage outside, and that was back before Phil the Bone Shaper was. Uh, resurrected and came with us. Phil, it, it was the three man, three man scenario. I feel the, feel the, feel the, yeah. <laughs> feel the road shaper. Get confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, that, that would be, that would be an epic scene. That would be the end of a, yeah. Like a, I don't know. Maybe it's an, a TV series, TV series. I feel like you can have a lot more ebb and flow with that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah definitely a component of that. So I, I'd say my last one, uh, and, and I mean, I kind of want to talk too much about it because it's spoilers, but uh, once you had an established cast, right, you've got your four characters, they're going through, uh, it's kind of like the Street Fighter-esque, a new challenger has appeared and Ormi appears <laughs> and Ormi then just creates uh, the headaches for the four main adventurers um, <laughs> on every journey they take on. Now, while we've only had to, uh, uh, only got the pleasure of, um, uh, hanging out with Ormi once, we do talk about him every single episode and whether it would be a good or bad Ormi scenario. And uh, I feel like that has just left an ongoing saga. <laughs> so I feel like from that point on, he's just that recurring character that keeps popping up being like, hey, guys, you guys <laughs> remember me? <laughs> so who plays Ormi? Oh, Ormi. Ormi. Um, I don't know, like like Bert from like Sesame Street? <laughs> <laughs> I picture like... Like someone like Michael Cera, um, from Superbad, like and and Arrested Development, he's always the, he acts the same in every oh, movie. Oh yeah, 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 okay. Someone All like right, him, yeah, who's so just bumbling and yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I say yeah, okay. All right, well, either either it depends if Bert's free, but if not, then we can get him. <laughs> okay, yeah. I kind of want to put this movie together now, like. Yeah, if we, someone we is a movie maker and has like animation. yeah, like heaps of time on their hands and wants to do it for free, um, <laughs> hit us up. Yes, no, that'd be awesome. Do it. Well, we're gonna wrap it up there. Uh, stick around. I want to say stick around because join us for the um, and the raw episode, which we're recording straight after this. But this isn't live, so it's not really sticking around. And yeah, gonna... and don't break the fourth wall down. Like they, they don't need to know that we're like saying goodbye now and then have it pop up later. Record again in like five minutes. Uh. Like we're just gonna jump and start recording again. Yeah, <laughs> like it just kind of feels a bit, a bit cheaty. I'm excited to talk about them though. Oh, I am too. I'm pumped. It's gonna be a great episode. If you would like to contact us, email us at contact at rollingterribly dot com. Wow, I'm talking way too quickly for myself. We can be you found need... on. Yeah. We need to get one of those uh those, like, those know, fast guys people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that just like spit end. out the terms and conditions oh, at the end of an insurance ad. Yeah. I can get Phil to do it. We can be found on Instagram at am underscore dirt, Twitter at umdirt, and youtube.com slash at amdirt. Uh looking forward very much to recording again uh, sorry, playing again on Monday. We'll find out where we go in the unfettered storyline then. Mm. Uh but thank you again for joining. Gaz and I uh, on another episode of A Master's Screen Rolling Terribly. Yep, thank you. And uh, remember, when it comes to rolling terribly, it's all in the rest. <laughs>